uh, caller. Uh, Jerome Ariola says a photo of a painting. Okay, great. So um, the process that you just did, vision is in itself a form of remote sensing. We do it every day, we do it unconsciously. And, and we're actually processing uh, lots and lots of data using our sense of vision. And in, in its very natural form, vision is a form of remote sensing. It's one of the key elements or the basic uh, instrument in remote sensing, our eyes. Uh, photography is another form of remote sensing. And, and, um, and of course, put at a higher level, we are uh, using satellites as, as a way of, of being able to gather information about the earth. Some briefly, uh, brief history about remote sensing, astronomy, the science of astronomy is part of the huge umbrella of, of science of remote sensing. It's one of the, you would say, earliest forms of remote sensing when we were able to uh, gather information about uh, planets. Um, in the 1800s, a camera flown over a balloon uh, uh, marked the first use of a camera on, on an aircraft or an air balloon to gather information about um, an area in, in France, okay? So quickly, again, because of its um, reconnaissance and information gathering uh, capability, a camera that's been flown on a pigeon, on a pigeon as well as, as uh, the development of the invention of the airplane, sort of uh, were the uh, first few, um, you would say, uh, nascent start of remote sensing okay? as a technology. Okay? And it was used, of course, for it has its own military applications, okay? um, which need not be further explained. It has lots and lots of uh, potential use in the military and reconnaissance. Okay? Now, uh, the first, uh, you would say, um, scientific use of remote sensing using satellites came around the 1970s when uh, NASA launched the first a satellite called um, ERTS-1 in 1972. And from then on, the science of remote sensing for Earth applications uh, was born. Okay? And um, a, a good confirmation of the use of remote sensing in, in um, uh, monitoring changes in the Earth's climate is was actually demonstrated with the ozone depletion hole that was detected in 1985. Okay? So quickly, that's how uh, remote sensing is in, in, in a nutshell, how it actually started. But we have remote sensing in nature itself. So there's remote sensing in the peak viper, it sees in the infrared, okay? Uh, apart from its uh, sense of vision, uh, viper actually has a pit organ that senses um, uh, things in the infrared or thermal, thermal visioning. So in, even in, in, in total darkness, it can actually capture its prey, okay? Bats uh, use a, a, a system called echolocation. So they use high frequency sound, which is also in a way a form of uh, remote sensing in nature. Okay? Similarly, dolphins have this uh, an organ called the melon, which uh, sends out high frequency chirps that enable dolphins to actually um, Prey, uh, even if the prey is actually underneath a huge uh, thickness of, of sand, okay? it can it can actually sense the fish and prey on the fish, even if it's invisible from the sight of the dolphins. Okay? But uh, when we talk about uh, satellite remote sensing, what comes to mind is is what we call as electromagnetic spectrum. So from here on, what will be the we will be discussing is actually um, the uh, the um, the uh, principle or the uh, um, the concept of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, remote sensing uh, main backbone is the use of of the uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum and the different wavelengths that compose the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. Uh, is a, a lot of physics uh, which goes with it, okay? So, but uh, we won't discuss into 
too much into the details of what the electromagnetic spectrum is, okay? Um, but just to give you a review of, of your physics, okay? Um, we know that the phenomenon of, of, of electricity and magnetism are two interrelated uh, phenomena, okay? And that um, uh, this phenomenon is actually um, uh, somewhat has a dual nature, okay? That's why we call it the electromagnetic radiation. It has, it has a dual uh, nature of being a, a, a particle it acts somewhat like a particle, but it also acts as some sort of a wave, okay? And um, uh, this is some sort of a visualization of the EMR, okay? So uh, when we talk of multispectral remote sensing, we're basically dwelling in the realm of using or capturing the electromagnetic radiation, which is coming mainly from the sun, from, from natural sources of, uh, of radiation or EMR, but there are also, um, you would say, artificial sources or man-made sources of EMR. Okay? And, and um, a good example of such artificial sources of EMR is, of course, radar and LIDAR. Okay? But for, for now, let's, let's um, be... Um, be discussing about a, a natural source of EMR, which is the sun, the main source of the electromagnetic radiation. Okay. So if we look at uh, what EMR is, is actually um, almost present everywhere. Okay. The minute that you turn on your TV, the minute that you turn your cell phone on, okay, make a phone call using your cell phone or connecting to the internet itself, we are always bombarded by the electromagnetic radiation. This is a short video just to give you um, what the characteristics of EMR is or are, sorry. And, and let's see this video. TV. 
Not only are there visible light waves from the TV striking your eyes, but also radio waves transmitting from a nearby station, and microwaves carrying cell phone calls and text messages, and waves from your neighbor's Wi-Fi, and GPS units in the cars driving by. There is a chaos of waves from all across the spectrum passing through your room right now. With all these waves around you, how can you possibly watch your TV show? Similar to tuning a radio to a specific radio station, our eyes are tuned to a specific region of the EM spectrum and can detect energy with wavelengths from 400 to 700 nanometers, the visible light region of the spectrum. Objects appear to have color because EM waves interact with their molecules. Some wavelengths in the visible spectrum are reflected and other wavelengths are absorbed. This leaf looks green because EM waves interact with the chlorophyll molecules. Waves between 492 and 577 nanometers in length are reflected, and our eye interprets this as the leaf being green. Our eyes see the leaf as green, but cannot tell us anything about how the leaf reflects ultraviolet, microwave, or infrared waves. To learn more about the world around us, scientists and engineers have devised ways to enable us to see beyond that sliver of the EM spectrum called visible light. Data from multiple wavelengths help scientists study all kinds of amazing phenomena on Earth, from seasonal change to specific habitats. Everything around us emits, reflects, and absorbs EM radiation differently based on its composition. A graph showing these interactions across a region of the EM spectrum is called a spectral signature. Characteristic patterns, like fingerprints within the spectra, allow astronomers to identify an object's chemical composition and to determine such physical properties as temperature and density. NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope observed the presence of water and organic molecules in a galaxy 3.2 billion light years away. Viewing our sun in multiple wavelengths with the SOHO satellite allows scientists to study and understand sunspots that are associated with solar flares and eruptions harmful to satellites, astronauts, and communications here on Earth. We are constantly learning more about our world and universe by taking advantage of the unique information contained in the different waves across the EM spectrum. So basically, um, in that video, it just sums up uh, the, the characteristics of the EMR. Okay? And uh, basically, in remote sensing, uh, multispectral remote sensing, we're dealing with this different wavelengths of the EMR, particularly that which dwells within the range of the visible, which our eyes okay, is sensitive to. This has a wavelength of around 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers. Okay? That's our sense of vision. That's all the only wavelengths which our eyes have been designed to detect. Okay? But since our eyes are only sense, I can only sense that um, a very narrow range of, of, the, of the EMR, we now have to develop what's called scanners or cameras or sensors that can actually sense beyond the visible wavelengths which our eyes are not sensitive to. So we have what, what are called um, infrared cameras or ultraviolet cameras, which can sense the EMR wavelengths that are beyond the, our sense of vision, which is from 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers. We are particularly interested to uh, study in this particular session what uh, and how infrared uh, wavelengths actually behave and how this actually is being exploited by remote sensing in terms of imaging such, uh, such examples like imaging the plant health. Okay? Most of remote sensing work specifically for, um, for detecting plant health dwells in the use of uh, wavelengths that are in the infrared. Okay. So, um, so here's a set of table that would show you the different wavelengths of, of the EMR. Okay. And in, in active remote sensing, when I say active remote sensing, this is artificial. Uh, there's the artificial source of the energy 
which I mentioned, there are two types. Uh, there's the sun, which is a natural source of, of EMR. And there's the artificial or, or human-made sources of, of EMR. And when we look at artificial sources, we're, we're basically talking about microwave. Okay, Microwave is also part of the EMR that's being exploited for other applications in remote sensing, okay? which is not going to be discussed in this session because it's it's somewhat of a another, you would say, a topic altogether. But just to mention about it, microwave is is one of the many wavelengths that's being exploited in remote sensing. Okay, so we ju we're just looking at a small sliver of the electromagnetic radiation when we use our sense of vision. Okay, it's just ranging from 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers. And there's a huge range of wavelengths or frequencies in the EMR that is, is still um, useful in, in, other, in other types of remote sensing. There's microwave, which in itself has different, um, you would say wavelengths, okay? And, and, um, and again, um, that's another discussion to be had in, in the future perhaps, okay? Now, in, in, in remote sensing, we are basically governed by the law of conservation of energy. Okay? So energy is conserved, cons conserved during the whole process of, of remote sensing. Okay? And the energy is actually coming mainly from the sun, which is a natural source of, of, of EMR. And some of this energy when it is incident on an object, in this case, the object is a, a leaf, okay? Some of the energy is actually absorbed, okay? In a process which we now call as uh, photosynthesis, okay? Some are, are actually transmitted back, okay? Or transmitted through the leaf itself. It just goes through the leaf and reaches the ground, but some are actually reflected back, okay? And when we talk about um, remote sensing, we're basically uh, involved or concerned with being able to capture the reflected energy. It is the reflected energy that we are most interested in when we talk about uh, remote sensing. Okay? That energy that is reflected back by an object. Okay? And um, a term which you will be encountering in remote sensing is, is called reflectance. It's somewhat synonymous to reflection, but it is actually a very, a, a, uh, you would say it's a very technical term. It says here, reflection occurs when an incoming radiation is redirected by a non-transparent surface. Okay? It's the energy that's reflected back off the surface of an object. Okay? Now reflectance is, or the reflection factor, or sometimes called the albedo, you may have encountered the term albedo. Albedo, reflectance, and reflection factor are all the same terms. They're all synonymous. Reflectance is the ratio of total, total reflected radiation divided by the total incoming radiation. Okay? So uh, again, the law of conservation of energy, it is actually the reflected radiation divided by the incoming or incident radiation. Okay? So it's actually a proportion or a percentage of, of the amount of reflected in, reflected energy, okay? It's a proportion or a percentage, okay? And it's often measured, it's actually, it's actually dimensionless, okay? Um, it, it ranges from zero to 100%, okay? That's, that's, a, that's the measure of, of uh, uh, reflectance, which is a basic measure in when we talk about uh, multi-spectral remote sensing okay? or for any any um, subject in remote sensing. Reflectance is a basic, you would say, um, uh, cornerstone, cornerstone uh, term that you should be aware of. Reflectance, which is the ratio of total reflected radiation divided by the total incoming radiation. Um, any questions so far? Am I talking too, too fast? Okay. Because 
because I was, I'm trying to cover a lot of ground <laughs> doing no, this no very No questions in the chat, Dr. Aban. No questions in the chat. You're doing great. Yeah, just just tell me if I'm talking too fast. I'm trying to cover a lot of ground. So <laughs> sort of trying to squeeze everything and uh, sort of uh, making um, useful, um, um, a most efficient, efficient way of using the time, limited time that we have. Okay, so okay, so you now are, are knowledgeable now or have been introduced to the term reflectance, okay? which is basic, a basic term in remote sensing. Um, there's other terms, absorption and transmission, which I will not go much into the detail of it, but just these are just terms that would be uh, encountered in, in the study of remote sensing, okay? So um, again, remote sensing basically tries to capture that portion of the reflected EMR, the reflected energy of an object, okay? Energy mostly coming from the sun for, for natural sources of, of EMR, okay? Now, uh, one of the first few um, applications of remote sensing was actually, or and still is, in, in the use in geology. That's why the first fleet of Landsat uh, satellites, which were developed in the early 70s up to the 80s, were basically geared or uh, focused into exploration, geologic exploration and mapping of the whole world, okay? Being able to see which uh, structures or which landforms actually harbor uh, um, um, you would say special elements or precious precious metals, okay, and and of course a, a way by which um, scientists geolo geological scientists who are do using remote sensing is to be able to see those spectral signatures. We now know that each object in the universe, okay, um, has its own specific spectral signature, and it has been clearly portrayed in the video that we saw that each object has its own response or reflectance response in the EMR. Okay? And this spectral signature is unique for that particular substance or element or, um, or object. Okay? In this case, we have, we have these sets of uh, minerals that have their own specific reflectance curves or spectral signatures which are useful for, for us to identify as to what object we are looking at in an image. Okay? Much like a medical doctor would see your, your, your ECG or EKG, he would know with a trained eye which, which graph indicates some sort of a, an issue or medical problem in, in, in the heart. Okay? It's the same, the same principle with a trained eye, with a trained... Uh, um, specialist in remote sensing, you would know if you're looking at an object, be it a plant, be, be it soil, be it water, based on the spectral signature or the reflectance response of that object in the different wavelengths of the EMR. Okay. Now, we are particularly interested to, to see or know why uh, plants behave in, in a particular fashion in the EMR, okay? So why do you think leaves are green, okay? I think it was mentioned in, in the video, just to um, probably check up on you if, you if you're listening to that video. Why do you think leaves are green, okay? Why are leaves green? One or two answers would be appreciated from the audience. We'll spend probably two minutes in this. Answers from the floor. Bob Barber came up with an answer in the chat. Green is the color reflected. Uh-huh. Any other answers to that uh, besides that? Okay, there being none, indeed, green is the, is the wavelength of light that is being reflected back by, by plants, okay? We see things to be green simply because that wavelength of light okay, 
particularly plants, is the light which corresponds to the wavelength green, okay, which is around 0.5 micrometers. That's the wavelength that's being reflected back by that particular object. Okay? But let's see a, a, um, another phenomenon here. Okay? I'd like to uh, place your attention to a camera which I just installed. Uh, it's actually one of the participants named John Doe. Okay? I probably have to put that spotlight on him on that particular. Are you seeing that, uh, that participant which has uh, put the spotlight on that? Um, do you see uh, do you see this uh, image being shown by John Doe? Okay, that's another camera that's installed on another computer that I have. Okay, so what do you think this image is? Okay, okay. what is this image? Okay, I'll answer my question. <laughs> this is actually an image of trees. Who is that? Sarai Vega. Okay. Sarai Vega just said that it's trees. Okay. But why is it showing as white? Okay. It is showing white simply because I'm using a camera that's sensitive to infrared. Now, the follow-up question is, why are the trees very bright in infrared? Why is it, is it that the trees are bright in infrared? Uh, uh, that's just one of the uh, limitations of the filter. There was a question, why is there a purple color? Okay. That's just one of the limitations of the filter inside the camera. Okay. But basically what I'm trying to show to you is that uh, this trees here are actually are reflecting back a huge amount of infrared. Okay. See, it's now moving. Okay. And and this 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 particular phenomenon okay, in, in in trees just simply tells you that trees reflect back a huge amount of infrared. It's just that our eyes cannot detect infrared but with specialized camera like I have, okay, which can actually um, capture or sense in the infrared, it can actually sense that huge amount of infrared being reflected back by plants. Okay? And if we had infrared eyes or eyes that are sensitive to infrared, and some of the military uh, gadgets do have infrared vision cameras, which can actually see at night, which are called thermal cameras, they can actually sense in the thermal infrared. Okay, so what I'm trying to, to tell to you now is that um, using remote sensing and specialized sensors and cameras, we are able to capture phenomena beyond the sense of vision and capitalize and exploit that phenomena to do some research and, and, and some sort of uh, applications. Okay? So this is just a, a, an example of, of a live demonstration of using infrared and being able to capture that huge amount of infrared being reflected back by, by plants. Okay? And how do we use this information? How do you use this information? Um, okay. Let me return to my, my, my slides then. Let me, so here's an image of an infrared, uh, infrared image of, of trees, okay? Similar to the live camera that we have actually. <clears throat> okay. so, um, so what happens is that the, the, the leaves, besides reflecting green wavelengths, which we, we see with our, with our eyes, since our eyes are sensitive to, a, to 0.5 micrometers of wavelength of light. Okay. We can see that as green, but since we cannot see infrared, we cannot sense 
the huge amount of infrared being reflected back by, by, by plants. That's why we need we need scanners, we need specialized camera, which I just demonstrated to you. Okay. But so this just demonstrates to you the trees and plants um, reflect back a huge amount of infrared. They actually use or absorb the red wavelengths for what particular purpose you think? What particular purpose? They absorb the red, they, they reflect back the green and the infrared and use, use what particular wavelength of the EMR? What do you think is the one that they absorb uh, in this in this particular uh, figure? Okay, and they use it for a very very important process, which we call as photosynthesis. Okay, they actually absorb the red wavelengths. Okay, the red wavelengths. Was there an answer to that? They actually absorb the red wavelengths for photosynthesis to manufacture food, okay, sugars and what have you. But they reflect infrared, uh, which we don't see, and which, which we now saw in, in, in that demo, infrared camera. They also reflect a huge amount of green. Okay? But actually, infrared has a higher amount being reflected back. Okay? And, and we use camera to... to capture that information, that huge amount of infrared being reflected back by plants. Okay, okay. so um, this is an example of a spectral signature of, of plants. Okay, this is one of, you would say, cornerstones of remote sensing. Um, when you come out of my class in remote sensing, by the time you're out of the class, when you see this graph, you know that this is a graph of a a plant vegetation, see? Here is the EMR quickly. This is the different wavelengths of the EMR from the short wavelengths to the longer wavelengths. And we have here the uh, reflectance, okay? The amount of reflected energy. And we see here some, some peaks and, and, and valleys in, in, the, in the spectral signature, okay? And we can see here um, some sort of uh, peak here, okay, which corresponds to the green wavelength. Green is actually around 0.5 micrometers. Okay. This peak here actually corresponds to the green wavelength being reflected back. And our, our sense of vision can capture that. Remember, vision can, can see or sense from wavelengths from 0.4 to 0.7, and we see this as green. Okay. Then after green, there's a dip or a valley here. And this corresponds to the red wavelengths. Okay? It says here, it shows here that red, since this is a spectral signature of vegetation, red is being absorbed by the leaves for photosynthesis. Okay? Then just after, just after the red, we find this huge amount of energy being reflected back by the green leaves, oh, sorry, by the, by the plant, okay? And this is actually corresponding to the infrared. Notice here that there's even huge amount of reflectance in the infrared as compared to the green wavelengths. Okay? And that's what makes it very, very interesting, okay? This is, this is infrared, which is totally invisible to our eyes and we cannot sense that. That's why we have uh, specialized cameras. And we can actually use this information to be able to uh, determine the condition of, of plants, okay? Uh, one of the most basic applications of remote sensing is for plant stress monitoring or uh, agricultural crop monitoring, okay? And actually this curve changes or the slope of the of the curve changes depending on the um, condition of the plant. If the plant is actually stressed, if it needs more water, if it needs more fertilizer, it's about to die or about to senesce. Uh, so for those of you who are working on, on uh, phenology or the, um, 
study of plant uh, characteristics as they go through the growth cycle. Okay? That's the science of phenology, which I'm also interested to work to do. Most of my PhD work was actually dealing with phenology. Uh, this is very important for, for you to, to learn how this slope of the infrared actually changes with the condition of the plant. Okay? If the plant is stressed, if it's healthy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And different types or different species of plants have different spectral curves. You can see here that you can actually identify which curve is, with, is an idealized curve for uh, for for um, for pine, birch, or fir, okay, quickly, just quickly. So each species has its own specific spectral curve, and you can see here the um, the usual uh, uh, um, peak in the green wavelengths, then a dip in the red wavelengths, and a sudden increase in the um, in the uh, reflectance in near the infrared. Okay, that's a characteristic plant spectral signature okay. so as i said it can provide you a way by which you can gauge the condition of plants if it's stressed or not it's watering uh, or not so for for large-scale agriculture um, this can be used for irrigation management and and what have you okay. just the many applications of remote sensing okay clearly um, water has its own characteristic spectral curve, okay? Uh, it's usually um, has a um, huge reflectance in the shorter wavelengths and, and actually tapers off or decreases as you go in the, into the longer wavelengths. So that's the characteristic of water, okay? So again, as I mentioned earlier, each object, depending on the substance or elements that's present in them have its has its own spectral signature. Okay. Water has its own spectral signature. Okay. So uh, soil as well as its own spectral signature, and uh, we will see that uh, in the hands-on um, part of this this uh, short webinar. Okay. Soil, uh, water, plants have their own specific spectral signature has its own behavior as you go from shorter wavelengths of the EMR to the longer wavelengths. Okay. And that's the key, uh, you would say that's the, those are the main pillars or the core, uh, you would say uh, core concepts that you should be aware of in, in uh, remote sensing. Um, I'm so sorry, I'm not following most of the chats, but uh, if there would be some some um, interjections coming from the um, from the moderators. I'll appreciate that. Oh, um, sorry, Dr. Aban. I've just been answering people on the chat, and I've been providing additional references on the chat if somebody wants to um, look at a topic more in depth. In depth, um, Dr. Barber just posted in the chat, and he is asking: Is it possible to count breadfruit trees on the island? from images um, and this would be interesting. And I was just about to respond to him as um, yeah. we could do it if we knew the yeah. spectral signature of yeah. the specific breadfruit. And each of the different species of breadfruit will have a distinct spectral signature. And if we, uh, and if right. the image is in multispectral image, then yes, we will be able to do that. Correct. You, you precisely what what uh, what you have uh, answered to Dr. Barber is, is exactly uh, correct. Precisely, one hundred percent correct. Thank you very much, Romina, for for managing the the chats. <laughs> I've, oh I've no been worries. That's flashing in, so I'm I'm just not able to respond to it uh, immediately. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And yes, we can actually. Uh, um, We've had some some researches being done on on um, three inventory. Uh, we, can, we have multiple sources right now that's coming in, especially with the advent of a new lidar, which would provide us with um, the volume of the tree itself in terms of the allometric volume of the the tree, the height, uh, the density of the canopy, 
coupled with multispectral, which we are discussing right now, it's a powerful combination of data sources that can actually provide us with, with uh, very good results, especially for tree species identification. That can be done, definitely. Thank you. And I'm excited to do that. We are excited, our team at Geography Program are excited to do that. Um, yeah, this is just a, a snapshot of, of the, you would say the common land cover types. When we say land cover, it can be, um, land, it can be vegetation, can be soil, it can be water, okay? So these are just the idealized curves, uh, so to speak. So water, as I mentioned, actually tapers off easily towards the longer wavelengths of the EMR and you would see a very short reflectance or small reflectance to near the shorter wavelengths of the MR. And of course, this green thing here, curve here is the curve of vegetation. And that red curve there um, simply represents an idealized curve of, of clay. Okay? So each of those uh, surfaces behave differently as you go from short wavelengths of the EMR towards the longer wavelengths. And that's the key, basically, how this, this signature changes from, from short wavelengths to long wavelengths. And you can, again, an example of, of, um, of this um, idealized curves, okay. Now, now, I've been discussing mostly the spectral uh, side of things, okay, how objects respond to EMR, okay. Are there any questions because we're now moving towards another concept of, of uh, remote sensing, okay. Any questions, anything unclear? Nothing, okay. So basically, uh, if we are to convert the responses in terms of the spectral responses of these objects into computer, you would say computer memory or computer information. We are now talking about radiometric analysis. Okay? So basically we are converting this spectral response into digital numbers. Okay? That's why I'm now segueing into um, what we call as digital numbers because this spectral response is proportionately converted into digital numbers. Okay? So that means a strong spectral or reflectance in one particular um, wavelength can be converted into digital numbers, which is also of a higher digital number. Okay? So basically it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's, it's a direct relationship. Okay? High spectral response, high, high digital numbers. Basically that's that. So in, in computer jargon, uh, we would say that a low digital number means a low reflectance or response, okay? Or that digital number actually is uh, near zero, zero value or a dark pixel, okay? I'm now moving into computer jargon. So, so pixels, okay? Or digital number, if you've heard about them, uh, it's, a, it's one of the building blocks of remote sensing, especially uh, computer remote sensing. Okay. Uh, now with high response, we have high reflectance. It means a high digital number. Uh, usually we designate it uh, for an eight bit. I won't discuss so much about eight bits or bits, bit, bit uh, functions of a computer. That's another topic to discuss. But basically digital numbers, if they are, have, have a high value, that means it has a high reflectance response, okay? So low reflectance, low digital number, high reflectance means high digital number of around 255, okay? So we speak about digital numbers in, in a lot with, with image processing. That's why I have to go through it somewhat quickly, okay? Just to mention about it, that the uh, building blocks of, uh, image processing are dealing with 
digital numbers and pixels, okay? And how this reflectance, which is spectral in nature, corresponds with digital number, okay? So here we have low reflectance, low digital number or dark pixels, whereas high reflectance means high digital number or bright pixels or br bright uh, digital number or high, high digital numbers. Okay. So basically that's the correspondence. Okay. Now I'm moving to the second topic, almost over with our first hour, okay? Hopefully I'm, I'm um, again, we, 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 we deal with, uh, in remote sensing, we deal with scanner types and, and cameras, okay? Um, your digital camera is a relative of the, uh, of the satellite scanners and cameras, that, those that are afloat in, in, in satellites, they're near relatives of your digital camera, okay? Of your cell phone cameras, they're all relatives, okay? And in them, we have what are called CCDs. CCDs are charged couple devices. Since we don't have much time, I'm going to speak to um, to skip that particular um, movie, okay, or video, okay? So just imagine that your cell phone, he has a camera and your webcam even is a near relative of those cameras that, that are afloat in space. It's just blown up probably uh, a thousand times okay, bigger and more sensitive. But uh, you know, those elements that you find in your camera, in your webcam are almost the same. They call them as CMOS or CCDs or charge couple devices. Okay. So in, 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 um, in a nutshell, uh, the images that you get from your from your vendor, from Landsat, from um, from NOAA, from your weather satellites, go through a very lengthy process of acquisition. Okay, uh, a remote sensing system basically has to have a a um, energy source or EMR source. In this case, the sun, and this energy is uh, reflected back and captured by the satellite, this is sent back, the image is sent back to ground receiving stations and the image are processed in, in, a, in a center. They get stitched, they get enhanced. If, if, if those images have errors, they get to correct those errors. It may be errors in the um, sensors themselves, which need to be corrected or recalibrated and they do that in, in the data pre-processing. Now, once they've corrected those images, they can now be um, either um, published publicly, okay? Or they, uh, for some of those commercial satellite providers, they sell it, of course, and they're almost uh, free of errors. Okay? So that's the whole process of, of catch, capturing information and receiving information as well as pre-processing. Okay. Now, what we want to do now is actually dwell in this particular last part of, of the, the um, life cycle of an image, which is basically data processing and analysis. Okay. So uh, I mentioned earlier that the first part was, was talking about spectral responses and how this spectral response is actually Yes, um, this spectral response is actually um, trans translated into digital numbers, okay? So here we have, if we can see this uh, graph here, you actually have the, the, uh, the curves, the, the, the common curves of, of here vegetation here, and you have the curve here of, of water, and you have the curve here of the dotted line, which is representing soil. As we have learned, each object, each surface, depending on its substance it is made from, has its own spectral signature. Okay? That's, that's, that's the, one of the core, you would say, concepts in remote sensing. And therefore, if you can capture this response, the spectral response in terms of, of digital numbers or images or pixels, you can now uh, have them as, as images, okay? 
and and um, that's why um, each of these pictures here represent the different bands or channels of a, a particular satellite called Landsat. Okay, so in 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 this particular image below, it says here TM band one. TM basically means thematic mapper. It's one of the uh, you would say uh, not so new, but probably around 20 years it was launched, thematic mapper of Landsat. This particular image here represents uh, an image that corresponds to a spectral or wavelength in the band one here, which is around 0 0.5, 0 0.5 micrometers. So if you were to capture a, a, an image of an area in, in 0.5 micrometers, here's the image that you would have. Okay. Then the other image here is the same area captured in a different wavelength. Okay. In this case, it's called TM band four. Okay. The same satellite, but a different wavelength sensor, which is sensitive to band four, which corresponds to around 0.9 micrometers, okay. which is actually in the area of infrared. Okay. And here TM band seven, okay, which is another channel of, of Landsat, okay, or one of the sensor channels of Landsat. It's sensitive to getting images or responses in band seven or around 2.3 uh, micrometers. Uh, am I making sense? Hopefully. So if if a sensor or a camera can actually capture in different wavelengths, okay, you can actually capture snapshots of uh, particular objects and how those objects respond at that particular portion of the EMR. Okay. So you have here a a, a set of images that would portray the same area captured in the different wavelengths. Okay. In this case, band one is here around 0.4 micrometers to 0.5 micrometers. Okay. Band two of Landsat TM, uh, this, this shows here band one actually corresponds to the blue wavelength. Okay. So anything that's captured here actually corresponds to the blue wavelength reflectance of that object. And band two is the green wavelength uh, area, which is 0.5 to 0.6 micrometers. Okay. And this is a spectral response at that particular wavelength. Again, these are all the same areas, okay, but captured in different wavelengths. Okay. Now red here is band three, 0.6, to 0 0.6 uh, 0 0.63 to 0.69 micrometers, and so on and so forth. We are particularly interested in, 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 in plant analysis and vegetation analysis to see how plants actually respond in band three and band four, which you will go in, in a few, I hope in a few minutes in our hands-on. Okay. Here band four, which is um, very important. Um, band four corresponds to the near infrared of Landsat and it can capture images in the wavelengths between 0.7 to 0.9 micrometers. Okay. So um, that's how um, sensors work. And if you look into those images, uh, blow them up, zoom into them, you're actually seeing them as a set of pixels. Okay. So each of those images you saw here, if you blow them up or zoom into them, they're actually a set of pixels. Okay? And these are the building blocks of, of image processing, remote sensing. We're working with what are called rasters. Okay? Rasters or pixels, each of those pixels correspond to a spectral response and a spectral response, which is translated into digital numbers. Okay? So again, uh, a low reflectance, low digital number, low value digital number, high reflectance, high digital number, okay? So if you are to look at them, okay, they're actually a set of pixels and raster image, raster, raster pixels, and they contain uh, value, 
they each of those pixels have a value which we call as a digital number. Okay. And if you <coughs> excuse me, composite them, you can actually have a composite of images in the different wavelengths of the EMR. Okay. Okay. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven composites of images that can be stacked together. Okay. And this is called a multi-spectral image. That's why we, we have this particular session dealing with multi-spectral remote sensing because uh, we, we deal with the different wavelengths of the EMR and how objects change their behavior or change their spectral signature as you go from one wavelength, from shorter wavelengths to the longer wavelengths. Okay. That's the essence of this particular web, webinar. Okay. I, I hope I'm, I'm, I hope I'm making sense. Uh, actually, you can, you can, can stop my, my video of Jando. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so far, everything's clear, I hope. Everything is okay. Before I move further, um, go further into the discussion, anything that needs to be clarified. Does anyone have any questions? Please note, you can always put them in the chat or you can ask them now. This is a great opportunity to ask away if you want. Get less, less than an hour for it. <laughs> okay, I'll do, it, do this quickly, very quickly. I think every, everyone's interested to do the hands on. No questions, Dr. Aban. I'm going to assume okay. that everyone understands this uh, perfectly. So carry on. <laughs> okay, so, so if you have a set of uh, a pixel and you have a, a mosaic of pixels, okay. We call that an image, right? If you look into each, each your your digital image on your camera, that that was taken by your phone or your or your digital camera, which I don't see a, people bringing their digital cameras anymore. Like ten years ago, you would have a digital camera and a phone separate, but now people just take pictures with their phone. Eh? So if you look into into those pictures, you see that these they have this these elements, which we call as pixels okay, or raster elements. Okay. And each of those pixels have digital number, which corresponds to the brightness value. Okay. The low value of digital number means uh, a low tone or um, a dark pixel. A high value digital number means uh, a high tone okay, or a high digital number. And it's the same. And each of those pixels, um, have its own position, okay? And when you have have a set of pixels all together in, arranged in a matrix, we call that as an image, okay? Are we in agreement to that? Okay. So basically, uh, remote sensing is playing around with images, okay? But these are not just simple images. They, they contain a lot of information, okay? And each of those images that you would get from Landsat has its own um, set of channels or bands okay, corresponding to the spectral, um, corresponding to the wavelengths as to the wavelengths, how to what, how these objects were actually captured. Okay. So here we have a Landsat image having different layers or channels corresponding to the wavelengths that they were captured. Okay. And uh, for, for Landsat, it has a pixel resolution of around 30 meters. That means each pixel that you see in Landsat, if you zoom into the, to the image of a Landsat, each pixel would correspond on the ground. It would represent 30 meter by 30 meter dimension or around 900 uh, square meters of, of area on the ground. So that's one pixel in, in Landsat. Okay. Now um, I won't talk about vectors, but basically with uh, with um, with uh, image processing, we're talking about or dealing with raster or pixels. Okay. And I mentioned that 
each, each raster has its own positional information for each of those pixels, as well as digital number value, okay? So a raster or a pixel consists of a matrix of cells or pixels organized into rows and columns or a grid where each cell contains a value representing information such as temperature. It can be temperature, it can be, it can be infrared information, which we have been introduced to a while ago. For some of you, I think uh, one of the research assistants of Romina is working with temperature images. So she's dealing with pixels that deal with temperature values, okay? Rasters are digital aerial photographs, imagery from satellites, digital pictures, or even scan maps, okay? Both uh, uh, raster has positional information. I've mentioned to you that each of those pixels in a grid correspond to a coordinate uh, information or coordinate space, okay? So it has geographic information as well. That's why satellite images are very special. They're not just simple um, uh, digital images. They contain several information, several channels, which corresponds to the spectral response, as well as coordinate information, meaning geographic information. Okay. So uh, in a nutshell, this is how a digital image would look in terms of digital number values. Each of those pixels has digital number corresponding to the brightness or the darkness of the spectral response. Okay. okay. That is a quick run through on uh, uh, characteristics of, uh, of uh, data in remote sensing. Okay, um, now we go into classification. Classification is, <clears throat> classification is, I would say, one of the most basic uh, processes that you would do with a satellite image. Okay? One of the first things I learned many years ago when I was uh, starting off in remote sensing, uh, when I was studying, is actually how to learn to classify. Okay? Uh, one of the ways by which uh, an image can be useful is to be able to segregate or separate each of those land cover types based on its um, based on its area. Okay, the amount of air that it actually occupies in an image. Be able to quantify, say, for example, how much a forest is is uh, uh, is uh, is actually occurring. Say, for example, in 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 Mangilao, how much area is actually planted with or infested with Tangan Tangan, which is an invasive species here in Guam. Okay, how much area is actually bare land? How much is area is actually um, built up? Okay, so the the one of the most basic processes or techniques that you would learn in remote sensing is classification, segregating these land cover types in terms of their um, nature. Okay, be it a vegetation, be it grassland, be it soil, be it water. Okay and be able to quantify them in terms of their area, okay? And that's what classification would actually try to attain, okay? <clears throat> when you do a process of classification in remote sensing. Um, uh, again, the process of classification uh, has many objectives to be able to identify vegetation types, for example, in remote sensing, as, as mentioned earlier, you can actually identify species okay, based on its spectral response. And therefore, if you can segregate species of plants like the breadfruit that was mentioned earlier, based on its spectral signatures, separating it from say tangan tangan or separating it from say coconut, which has its own spectral signature, then you can actually segregate these different species of plants, plant species, into their own, um, you would say, sets of pixels in area covered. Okay. okay, so those are just some of the many uses and purposes of classification. Geologic terrains, okay. mineral exploration, which I said earlier is, was the main driver for for the US, particularly for America to, 
uh, start the um, Landsat missions, mainly for mineral exploration okay, and a host of other applications of image classification. Uh, again, classification makes use of spectral classes. Okay. And basically when, when you do classification, you're basically dealing with how the digital numbers behave okay, in terms of the, uh, of the wavelengths. Okay. So each of those uh, digital numbers okay, or pixels tend to behave uh, quite distinctly in, in specific uh, wavelengths or bands. Okay. We now know that uh, water would have its own specific behavior uh, and it would tend, tend to have high values when it's, it's, it is imaged in the um, shorter wavelengths. Okay. Whereas plants, plants and vegetation would have behavior having high values or high digital numbers when you're imaging it in infrared, okay? So these pixels or vegetation, they tend to cluster, okay? They tend to group each other based on its uh, digital number, okay? And that's the main thing that a classification does. It looks for clusters of digital numbers that are near near its statistical values, okay, standard deviation, what have you. Okay. And it looks for those clusters and they try to um, group them together and identify that as one class. So you see here a, a um, uh, I would say that a demonstration of how an image, if you try to look at them in terms of uh, its responses in the digital number, they tend to cluster. For example, here, this is the cluster of, of pixels representing water. They would tend to cluster if you were to plot them in terms of their um, channel, channel one versus channel two. They tend to cluster. And this is where the, um, the power of classification comes in. It tries to look for those clusters and group them as, as one land cover type. So once you do the classification process, it will, um, we will be able to classify each of those pixels in terms of their uh, true nature, in which case you would say this one would represent paddy, this would represent sand here, which is another cluster, and this cluster here represents water, okay? That's water, right? Dr. Aban, uh, Jerome, yes. Ari Jerome Ariola is asking you specifically about your, uh, have you used k-means clustering or um, do you do it manually? Because um, I, I know that for classification large data sets, definitely we've been, we've been going into the realm of AI for it, but yes. I'll, let, I'll let you feel wow. this. Uh, K means wow, that's an advanced uh, term to to be uh, to be had in this uh, webinar. Uh, there are a lot of uh, new tools that um, that are, have not existed five years ago. There are um, um, uh, K means is one of them. Uh, I think K means has been in existence for it's it's one of the unsupervised um, um, clustering method. Okay, uh, there are new even AI-based clustering methods, fuzzy logic, neural networks, those kinds of things. Okay, these are new, new, um, new techniques that are uh, constantly evolving. Okay, and it, it depends. Uh, if if it's really hard for me to do the manual class classification methods, the classical way, which is like maximum likelihood, I would try artificial intelligence or k-means clustering if, if so needed, depending on, on the situation, okay? But uh, there are a hand, uh, new, new techniques that are uh, evolving. As I talk, there are newer techniques that are being uh, developed by different groups of image processors, okay? And K-means is, is one of the most powerful, I would say, in terms of, uh, um, uh, what's this, uh, neural-based 
uh, neural-based network uh, systems of uh, classification. Whoa, who's that who requested? Jerome. So you must be doing uh, some image processing already, I suppose, Jerome Ariola. Great, good question. So in, in classification quickly, um, it's a series of steps. Okay? You define the classes, select the feature, uh, do a sampling training area. Okay? Uh, then you do the classification. There are two types, basically the supervised and the unsupervised. Uh, we'll go to that quickly. Okay? So here we basically um, define the classification classes. So it, it actually depends on you, how many classes you would like to come out of a particular image. Okay. In our hands-on later, we will, we will try to come up with just five classes, five basic classes coming out of an image. Okay. Uh, mainly to, 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 to um, disintegrate the image in terms of its land cover types, be it vegetation, be it uh, water, be it soil or built up areas, et cetera, et cetera. Now selection of features, okay, uh, comes second, okay. And you basically have to inspect uh, the image itself, the, the integrity of the image itself. In most cases, uh, the images that you would get from Landsat and, and commercial satellite image providers would give you very clean cloud-free images, okay? And that means this has gone through quality control and you should be able to discern uh, some features out of those images. Now comes the third part, which is that sampling of training data. Um, this is the most important part, especially for uh, a, a process which we call as supervised classification you actually identify specific pixels in the image as the training data, okay? When we, when we say, what we say as training data is this, the data that you would tell the computer as a set of pixels that you would like that the computer to look for in similar pixels inside that particular image, okay? Then comes the fifth, fourth, process, which is classification. Basically, you just run the, the process of classification uh, with the training data that you made earlier and, and um, let the computer run the classification. And later verification of results, including accuracy assessment. Okay. So basically in, in classification, we have two types. These are the classical ones, supervised classification where you yourselves, me as, a, as an analyst, define the training classes from which the computer will, will use as a sample and get similar pixels from the image. Okay. That's supervised. You are supervising the computer to do a, a, um, a search within the image of similarly looking pixels. That's why it's called supervised. The unsupervised is, is you just let uh, the computer do its own thing of classifying the image based on a set of rules, okay? okay. And then um, K-means clustering is one of them, one of the uh, unsupervised classification methods, okay? Okay, uh, I think this is better appreciated if we can actually jump in to, to the hands-on itself. So uh, I like and classification as uh, as if you're training your dogs your dog okay so basically uh, here your dog is is the computer and you have this pixel okay, it, or sets of pixels that your dog or the computer you want to fetch within that image you say that fetch all image all pixels of similar digital numbers of similar responses in terms of the, of the uh, spectral response or digital numbers and fetch them and group them into one into one um, uh, land cover type okay so it's like training your dog okay or probably um, who of you among you does laundry every week <laughs> especially the men okay 
what's the first thing that your wife would say if you have a, um, a spouse, okay? Separate the whites from the colored clothes, okay? Because if you, if you basically uh, join the white clothes or the bright clothes with uh, um, light clothes with the colored clothes, especially the red colored clothes, it may actually stain together, okay? So it's basically trying to separate which pixel belongs to a specific class. Okay. And it's actually, the whole thing is actually, um, you would say governed by statistical rules. Okay. Some of these things which, some of these uh, classifiers you may have encountered in your statistics class, okay. The minimum distance to means classifier, okay. Parallelly piped classifier and a maximum likelihood. These are all statistical processes uh, that are um, based on statistical rules and and um, the backbone of uh, remote sensing is both physics and statistics. Actually, okay. quickly um, we we have learned about this earlier. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> we, we can represent the data as a, as a distribution, okay? in which case it, it is governed by statistical rules. And we have such terms like histogram. You've encountered this in statistics. Okay? A histogram is an approximate representation of distribution of, distribution of numerical data. Okay? So here we have the histogram of those digital numbers per per channel, okay? So those uh, digital numbers, depending on how many there are in an image, can be represented as a histogram, okay? And they actually ha have specific distributions depending on the um, spectral response, okay? So in this case, this is an example of a histogram for, for a particular uh, say channel. So you have distribution here of of uh, of the digital numbers, and it can just show you that looking at this particular histogram, if this were an image, what do you think is the image uh, looking like? Is it dark or very bright image based on the histogram? Most of the distribution of this histogram, even though I haven't seen the image would tell me that, that, that this particular image is actually very dark or bright. Any guesses? Is it dark or bright? Enki, Enki Yang guessed dark the first time. And then You're I right. think, yes, she was right at dark. It's dark. Yeah. Yes, because dark. most of the digital numbers are actually towards the darker portions of this of the uh, distribution, which are the low value digital numbers. Okay, okay, and 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 each of those channels are actually uh, can be represented in terms of histograms or digital uh, distribution. Okay, again, just to show you the link of what we have been discussing so far. And this is basically how uh, the statistical processes come in. They look at it as distributions of histograms, okay? And look at this, these histograms and how they're actually clustered, okay? Quickly, okay? Now, in, in classification, you have to do some training, okay? Uh, as I said, in supervised classification, you tell the computer to look for this similarly looking pixels and look at the whole image and look for them and cluster them together. So these areas which we look, which we will be doing in, in a few minutes, I think in a couple of minutes, we will do some trainings on, on the image using supervised classification, okay? And we will do those training areas, okay? For those, um, for those images, okay? Quickly, uh, statistical processes that go with um, supervised, uh, sorry, classification. Uh, again, these are all statistical terms, minimum distance to means classifier, okay? Each would have its own different output, okay? Depen depending on the classifier, uh, parallelly piped, okay? Again, just to, um, um, giving out terms that you would encounter 
another classifier, okay, maximum likelihood, which is a common um, statistical process, okay, is also used in remote sensing, okay, again, a different output uh, uh, when using a, diff, uh, a different type of classifier. Okay, quickly, um, I think a lot of this can be better appreciated if we go into our hands-on, okay? So 30 minutes to do a hands-on. Okay, uh, I think people were actually um, informed that part of this webinar would be a hands-on exercise. Uh, that would uh, enable people to follow um, or have a, a initial maiden use of a software called Multispec. Uh, has everybody been able to download a copy and install in your computers, as well as an image that I sent earlier for uh, distribution, I hope? Um, I reposted John's uh, post. Um, uh, giving everybody the links to download Multispec. That's the software that uh, we will be using. It's open source for remote sensing and image processing. Uh, this is Dr. Aban's preferred. I use proprietary software, which is expensive and not very good at, you know, once you leave academia. So I think it's great that Dr. Aban is here we set, we complement each other in terms of exposing students to various um, <laughs> various softwares. His is free, and I advocate for it, and I think it's it's great. I just was trained on on software. We have to we had to purchase, um, and uh, and again, I also put in the chat the image that uh, you will be using in in multi spec. So, yeah. Thank you so much for that um, introduction, uh, sort of a um, um, intro on, on how uh, I am with free and open source software. I, I champion free and open source because I'm cheap. No, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I think education uh, that might, should not limit you from um, learning high high technology or high high value research. If you're, you're limited with, uh, you know um licensed software and in my gis uh in my gis um what's this course i also use free and open source qgis okay. um, um i've been using multi-spec for um, several years now i think almost 15 years since i stumbled on this software which was developed by purdue university it's meant to to uh introduce um students, especially newbies in remote sensing, and that uh, a sensible research and study can be made with just very simple software such as this one. It's not heavy on memory. It's not heavy on your computer, uh, but it can do a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, sensible and, and decent work in remote sensing. So um, yes, if you have your um, multi-spec installed in your computers, I would uh, open, we'll, we'll do a quickly uh, supervised classification, which is, oh no, unsupervised because it's, it's somewhat much, much easier, okay? So as I mentioned earlier, there are two types, basic types. One is supervised and unsupervised. Unsupervised, basically you let the computers do, do the thinking, so to speak, or do the, um, do, do the, the decisions of clustering those uh, pixels into their specific uh, land cover types. Okay, so what I would do is quickly um, open an image. The shortcut actually. Are you seeing my 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 desktop right now? Are you seeing it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are you seeing multi? Are you seeing multi spec? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, multi spec is drag and drop also. So you just have to drag and drop the image that we're playing with, okay? I send out a download link for the image. It's a Landsat image of Guam, mainly of the airport and towards the area of Mangilao, I, I think, yeah. And it's an old image. It's just for demonstration that I used an old image. Okay. 
So basically, when you drag and drop that image into lands into multi-spec, you'll be given this um, set display specifications. Okay. So basically, here, uh, are you seeing this uh, this window of set display specifications? Just to be sure. Yes, I yes, yes. Okay. So basically, I loaded the Landsat image, and here you're, you're given the uh, choice of of displaying which of the channels of Landsat will be displayed. Okay, in this particular um, um, image that we have, we have six channels which corresponds to the different wavelengths or channels of Landsat from the shorter wavelengths to the longer wavelengths. Okay. For here, we have channel four, which corresponds to the infrared, which we will display as a red, red in the in the um, in the monitor. Okay, remember, I, I think I didn't tell you that, but in my courses, I would say that the computer has three sets of uh, I call that um, layers that can only that it can only um, display. This is the red, green, and blue gun, blue guns. Okay? And the colors that you see is actually a combination of intensities of these three basic uh, uh, additive colors. Okay? So here we are going to display uh, four, which corresponds to infrared of Landsat. Three corresponds to the red channel of Landsat and two to the uh, uh, two to the green channel of Landsat. Sorry, uh, sorry for uh, using numbers instead of uh, the actual uh, wavelengths, but because I've gotten to used to know which channel corresponds to the number. But just to tell you that what you will be seeing here is an image of the infrared mostly shown as red. Uh, and that corresponds to vegetation, okay? And here is, uh, there is a, so a chart, no, it's not limited. It can be used for any satellite image. There is a question, is this software limited to Landsat? No, it can be used to any satellite image that has different channels, okay? Okay, here is an image of Guam. Uh, back in time, 20 years ago of uh, somewhere, this is, I think, Tijan, and here is, of course, the um, Pacific side, and I think captured here also is our parts of uh, UOG, okay? So all the reds that you see here is actually um, uh, representative of vegetation, okay? And this type of image is called a false color image. In remote sensing, uh, you have to change your perspective as you see how you see color. And it took me a while uh, when I was starting out in remote sensing to really change my perspective that, okay, all these, all the reds that you see is actually, inf uh, is actually um, vegetation, okay? So here, the reds simply represent vegetation, okay? And those white areas would represent um, uh, built up areas, okay. You can see here uh, a semblance of an airport, the airport that we have. And I think here is are the golf courses that you would see near Mangila, okay. I think Mangila, I forgot the name of the golf, golf course. Okay. Um, I can, I can um, put another image here that would somehow orient you, orient you to a better perspective of that area. I would now display another image using true color, okay? And that would mean I would have to do this kind of combination, okay? Takes a while to uh, really be able to memorize the channels of, of Landsat, okay? But basically what I'm trying to do is display the different channels into their own corresponding guns of the computer. So here's a is a natural, you would say true color image of of uh, of Guam of that part of Guam in 2001. And this looks like more sensible. 
you have here the Pacific Ocean, the coasts, um, the beaches here, and here you have green areas here. Okay, and you have the airport. So this is called a true color versus this one, which is called a false color image. And in remote sensing, we deal a lot with the false color image, in which case you have uh, vegetation seen as, as being red, okay? So I'll remove this one. Okay, uh, quickly, um, this um, unsupervised classification is, is uh, quite a breeze to make, okay? Especially with practice, okay? So we're going to do unsupervised first. And you can do this simply by clicking on processor. And you see your cluster, which gives you a cue that this is actually um, unsupervised. Clustering is another term for unsupervised. And this would give you another window, it says here. And the first thing to click in sequence is first you click the image area. And this just tells you the um, dimensions of the image itself. It's an image of uh, having 269, um, 269 lines, or you would say rows. Okay. There's 269 rows and 265 columns. Okay. So it's a 269 by 265 uh, image of, uh, of Guam taken in 2001 by Landsat, okay? So once you've clicked that, you click on this other thing here called isodata. Okay. And this is basically the algorithm that you will try to use, okay? So for this exercise, we will use uh, um, the initialization option of a long first eigenvector, okay? Which I now click, okay? And um, for this exercise, we want for the computer to identify five clusters or five classes in the image, mainly vegetation, water, uh, soil, built up areas, and probably uh, sparse vegetation or, or grasslands, okay? So basically, uh, again, it depends on you, okay? It depends. For example, if you're working with invasive species and you want to demarcate each of those species in terms of being invasives and non-invasives, for example, tangan-tangan, okay? You want to identify tangan-tangan for, for as one of the classes and the other um, class perhaps would be like coconut or uh, the other class would be say, um, breadfruit or whatever, okay? You can, you can have as many classes as you want, again, depending on your own particular study or particular research, okay? For this demonstration purpose, we're, we're just looking at clustering the image in terms of its land cover type, okay? So uh, I've settled with having five clusters of, of, of uh, groups of, of uh, classes, okay? And the minimum also that we would put would be around five clusters or classes. Okay. Uh, you put this value as 99 or 100 so that all of the pixels will be classified or forced to be classified into those five clusters. And um, that's what we will have to do. Click on this one along first icon vector set the number of classes in this case for this demonstration of around five classes or clusters and set those conversions at 100 and the minimum cluster size of five okay and we click okay then um, we we um, just click some of these boxes here okay Click uh, text disk file. Um, I think uh, we don't have to click the click cluster mask file, okay? And we click okay. Now, once you, cl once you click that one, you are requested to make a file name for the new image that you want to create, okay? In this case, I would give it a name 
demo um, MS, which is multi-spectral okay. MS webinar. Okay. I would label it with an unsup, meaning it's an unsupervised image. Again, it, it depends on your naming convention. I would usually give it a very descriptive file name. So, so that would enable me to find it again later. <laughs> so I would give it an unsup suffix just to tell me that it's an unsupervised image that I made. Then put a dot there and give it an extension of TIFF. That TIFF is basically one of the most common uh, images in remote sensing. It's a GeoTIFF image that will be produced from this classification. Okay. So once you've named it, this is my naming convention. You can have yours. Okay. But uh, this is my naming convention. And just click Save. Okay. Now, once you click Save, you can see a, a, uh, a text output that's running in the background, okay? Have you seen that on your side, okay? So this is basically what's running on the background. This is called the text output window, which gives you a, a log of what has been done on, on your image, okay? So it started out with this particular image called Landsat Quam 2001 Multispectral GIF. And you were, you were requesting for five clusters to come out of it. So it's basically a log that has, that gives you information, textual information of the processes that were conducted. Okay, and and this is very good actually. It doesn't uh, it doesn't show up in other licensed software that I've worked with. It, this gives me a very good handle on what's happening at the back of the computer. Okay, and that's why I I like MultiSpec a lot. It's simple but it's also powerful, and you can see here. As you go down that um, text file, it, it follow your command to cluster the image into five clusters, which we have here. Okay. And you can see here how it actually assigned each of those pixels into a specific group or cluster okay, or class, okay, depending on how it was how it was able to cluster them. Okay. So this is a representation of Yes. <laughs> so you can actually see the, the clusters that have been made out of that image based on the cluster label or class label. Okay. So that's the image in terms of the cluster or classes. And finally, you can see here this summary um, sort of table shows here that cluster one has this number of pixels. These are the number of pixels that's been clustered into class, cluster one or class one. We still don't know what it is. We will see later when we inspect the image itself, okay? And in cluster two, it has classified 6,240 pixels as belonging to cluster two and so on and so forth. So these numbers represent um, number of pixels that's been classified into that particular class or cluster or land cover type, which we still don't know. We have to label it later, okay? Now, what what is the significance of this? This numbers of pixels represent area. Remember, you're dealing with an area on the ground, okay? And if you know the area, uh, the number of pixels that's been classified into that, and if you know the area of Landsat, which we now know as 900 square kilometers, so you just have to multiply 900 square kilometers, which is one pixel of Landsat, multiplied by the number of pixels that you have here on that particular cluster. Okay. Do, am I making sense? So you can now actually quantify how much of an area this cluster two represents in terms of real areas on the ground. Because we know Landsat is around um, 900 square kilometers, uh, square meters in area per pixel. And if you know the area of, of that Landsat pixel, multiplied by this value, you can have an area of the whole class itself, okay? So that's the essence, that's the significance of classification, okay? 
So here we have a, a, a summary of nine and out. Okay. So if we add, add them up all, okay. there are some pixels which are not classified. Okay. I don't know why it's showing up. Okay. Anyway, here it is. Here's the summary of what happened. Now, now let's ex let's um, examine the the unsupervised image that we have created. Okay. So I just click open file yeah there's this one demo ms webinar and soup which is the image while uh, image class unsupervised classified file we made okay. just click on that okay and we have this particular image okay so here is the classified image of this of the Landsat thing that we had, that image we had earlier. Uh, I didn't have time to go through the functionalities of multi-spec, but basically it has the same functionalities as a as a uh, licensed software. It's just that it's 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 a bit uh, you would say crude in a way because there's no sliding bars here and here and there, but you have this icon which can let you zoom in and zoom out okay they look like mountains actually zoom in zoom out okay. so it's almost if you're using um such softwares like erdas or envy which are licensed and very expensive <laughs> of course it comes with a price and it comes with some convenience but this one provides you some of the crude convenience but it can do the same thing okay okay so here's a an image clustered Super unsupervised image of, of, the, of the, the the same uh, Landsat image. You can actually um, be able to see which of these classes were classified for this one okay, by by just clicking on putting your uh, cursor over that uh, palette and shifting again. This, I didn't go with the um, uh, methods of how to use multi-spec because of limited time, but you can actually. Uh, um, turn on and off those pixels that were classified. In this case, we know, know that this is Pacific Ocean. You can actually change the label, use water, okay. And you can turn this on and off. And again, I wasn't able to teach you that because of limited time. Uh, this would represent, say, um, mostly uh, forested areas. So I would label that as forested okay probably we don't we don't know if this is actually tangatangan most of uh, most of guam is actually covered with tangatangan anyway okay and this one um based on my uh, i would say this is mostly uh, sparse vegetation uh, might I'd actually represent sparse vegetation or grasslands, okay? meaning these are low, low lying vegetation. Okay? And this one, okay, they actually mostly represent, I'd say, built up areas. So built up areas, meaning these are human structures, okay, buildings, okay, and roads even, and even the tarmac shows up as a built up area. And okay, those yellow things may represent soil or bare soil. And Dr. Aban, right after the yes. classification, I uh, just wanted two things. One, we have eight minutes left. And then uh, mm -hmm. one thing that I think you should also mention is that after we do this computer work, we actually have to send somebody out in the field yes, to verify definitely. what we did <laughs> was correct. And that's, that's the ground truthing part. And that's always fun too. Precisely. Yes. Thank you for making that point. Um, 
before the 1980s, uh, most of the remote sensing work was, uh, there was no process which we call as ground truthing or accuracy assessment. But there's a, a segment of any remote sensing work when you do, specifically when you do classification is you have to do some ground truthing, which uh, Dr. King has mentioned, is basically being able to um, calibrate or check if your classification process was actu actually accurate, uh, being able to put a quality mark as to how much correctness was your classification process. We call, we call that as accuracy assessment. And there's a whole, uh, you would say, uh, lesson to that towards the end of the uh, course that we have. It's called accuracy assessment, where you learn how to do the um, putting a quality stamp mark that say is 86% correct or 90% uh, accurate. What can be seen on the image is what you can see on the ground. And it's a very important segment of any um, remote sensing work. You have to do some quality check, which can be done by ground truthing or accuracy assessment. Correct, precisely. Yes. Um, I don't know if people have time to spare another 10 minutes. I know I'm overshooting my time, but I would also would like uh, possibly to just have a quick run through on on, on um, supervised, it's a very quick one, just to give you uh, what is the main difference in terms of the process. If people can spare like 10 minutes only, it will be a very quick one. Is that okay, moderator? Uh, my time is 4.54, so we will overshoot by five minutes. That, that's okay. I, I can stay late, but if people have to go, uh, please, uh, we are respectful of your time. You can go. And again, this is being recorded. So if you miss the, the, um, the supervised classification, you can always go back to the recording and, and check it out if you want. But yes, we, I, will, I will be here to, um, to moderate. Sure. Thank you so much, moderator. You're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Quickly, uh, this is a run through of supervised classification just to give you a, a, a comparison how it's actually done. Remember, uh, this is the, the raw image that we're working on. Uh, just go again to processor. Now we click on statistics. Okay. In this case, you just click OK, nothing to change here. Just click on, on this particular image, uh, this particular window. Click on that, and it should give you this. I'm oh, sorry, I have to clean and make a clean slate to make it better. So just loading the same image, uh, displaying it as four, three, two, which is the false color image. Then processor, you click on statistics. Okay. Just click on that image, uh, that, that window, and this will give you this particular uh, sub window pop, popping up. Okay. Now, um, as I mentioned, supervised classification just makes use of training classes, okay, which is basically telling the computer uh, to fetch similarly looking, similarly. Um, having the same digital number value pixels and getting from the image and classifying it as one class okay, or one cluster. Okay. So here we have to define the training classes once this, um, once this um, window shows up. So this is clearly easy to define the training class for water. You just click and drag. Okay. And this uh, thing, this sets of coordinates will show up. And it just says, just click on this add to list. This is the first training class for water, okay? You see the difference? At the onset, you actually define the class itself, okay? Which is in this case, water. Okay? And in the unsupervised, you, uh, the, the computer blindly clusters them and later you define or describe that particular cluster in terms of its real um, makeup, if it's water, if it's a bare soil, if it's 
if it's uh, built up areas. So it's somewhat of the reverse. So we click on water, okay? And say, let's zoom in uh, here. Say, for example, here, I would say this is built up, okay? Since this is mainly um, been built up by man, okay? Say, for example, built up areas. So build that up, sorry. Then of course this bright red here, I would say this is mainly forested areas, okay? Or tangan tangan, so we still don't know, okay? But it's mainly showing up as bright red. And I would say this is uh, forested areas. And what else do we have? This dark red areas, I would presume this would be mostly um, low vegetation or sparse vegetation because the infrared response is quite low. Okay? So I would say that's sparse vegetation. What else? That's field four. And lastly, Impermeable surface. E, what were the classes we have built up? Oh, you did built up. Okay, never mind. You did uh, build up. I think, uh, yeah, what was the other one? Would you remember? Um, I think bare soil was, was it, right? Yes, bare soil. Yeah, the, the, um, you see here there's, there's this brown thing showing up here which is different from this red area so i would say for example this is your sample of bare soil bare soil okay so we've defined five classes similar to what we have with the unsupervised so basically that's that's the condition that you have you want to come out from this image are five classes and and that's what we did and you just have to run it since we already have these training classes from where, from which the computer will choose other similarly looking pixels and group them into those specific classes. So once you've defined the training class, uh, you just click uh, classify. Okay. And nothing much to change here. You see here this maximum likelihood. These are just the statistical processes that you want to use. The most common, of course, is maximum likelihood. You have another ch uh, choice of minimum distance, Euclidean, Euclidean, et cetera, et cetera. These are just the statistical processes, okay? Nothing much to change here, except you want to save it as a disk file, okay? So basically you would saving another image, which is the supervised image, uh, comparing it with the unsupervised image we did earlier. And I think that's it, nothing to change here. Just click okay. okay. So you have to define a new image and say, this is the un this is the supervised, which I will now call it a supervised okay, to distinguish it from the unsupervised and give it an extension of TIFF. Okay. So this is the supervised and save. And voila, uh, the process has been done. So that's quick. Again, um, the text output shows you on the background scene what's happening inside the computer, okay? So we have this uh, sets of text, text information which you can actually look into later and see a, a set of summary table which is so useful in, 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 in remote sensing work gives you uh, the number of pixels that been that's been um, that's been classified as such okay, based on the classes that you did okay so here's a summary table okay telling you that uh, in terms of hectares already because the, the computer knows that each pixel is around 30 by 30 meter area so you can easily convert it in, ter in terms of hectares so for water, there's around 1,100, sorry, 1,144,000, sorry, 
350 hectares of water in the image. In terms of built up, it has around 2 million blah, 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 2.7 million, 2 million hectares. Forested areas is around 1.3 hectares. Sparse vegetation, 862,000 hectares and bare soil of around 309,000 hectares. Okay. And we can look at the, the sample or the resulting image from the supervised one, just by opening the image, clicking on that. And this is the supervised image. Okay. Again, you can uh, manipulate this image, okay, um, just changing or clicking in and out, changing even the colors. If you want it blue, you can change that. Change this one to say green, dark green. You can change that. Grassland, say light green. Change that. Built up, say you make it gray for uh, cement and bare soil. Let's make it say um, somewhat brown or something. This one should be fine. I don't like the build up, probably make it something like this. Yeah. There it is. Uh, this is the image coming out of a supervised classification process. And again, you have this uh, text output. Okay? The text output image, a uh, text output window gives you the statistics or the processes that were. Um, made on that particular image. And this information is extremely useful for your um, remote sensing work. Not only the image, but most importantly, how much of the image has been classified, okay? Um, no more time. I'm off my my, my time by four minutes. Um, but I no. would like to... This is just a foretaste of what you can do with remote sensing. Uh, there are a lot of other techniques we like NDVI, normalized division, difference vegetation index, change detection. There's of course LIDAR. Uh, there's just a ton of techniques that you can learn. If you do enroll in our classes in at the geography program, um, it can have various applications, be it social sciences, uh just to give you um a sort of a a um a teaser we're now uh <laughs> my colleague and i are king are really looking at archaeological applications of remote sensing, which is <laughs> so exciting for me because i'm more of a physical scientist rather than a social scientist and it would really be very 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 interesting to really work with social scientists anthropologists archaeologists out there or archaeologists to be students who are uh, trying to marry in archaeology we'd like to work with you our program is open for collaboration and Rom dr romina king is 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 a champion of geography geography Viva geography. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah just lastly um this sem we are offering introduction to gis okay which is a, a stepping stone into remote sensing. But of course you can learn remote sensing side by side with GIS. But those two tools are equally important to, to be learned, okay? Equally important. That's it, uh, Dr. King, sorry for overshooting my time. No, my you're, fi you're fine, it's six minutes. Uh, does anyone have any last questions or comments? Um, uh, you may want to read the chat. I, Jerome wrote a very lovely thank you note to you, Dr. Aban. So uh, you may want to hey, check Jerome. that out. Uh, but does anyone else have any other comments or questions? What is the day and time for the GIS class? So we're, we, uh, we are offering GE 480, Special Topics in Geography, Introduction to GIS. That is the undergraduate one. Concurrently, we are also are offering. Sorry, oh, yeah. excuse me. Sorry to. Oh, yes. Yeah. Do you have it on here? No. Yes, you do. And uh, yes, yeah, so GE 580 is being taught concurrently with GE 480. GE 580 would give you graduate credit. 
for uh, introductions to GIS, you have to do more work than the undergraduates do. But, uh, but again, it's, um, it's a way for graduate students to learn uh, GIS and receive some uh, graduate credit for it. Um, other other uh, GIS remote sensing classes being offered, I believe Dr. Mark Lander at Weary is offering um, remote sensing uh, weather applications. So uh, I, I don't know what day and time he teaches it. He usually polls his students and he picks a time that works for everybody. Dr. Aban, when is GE 480 meeting uh, day and time? And I mm -hmm. is it face to face? Um, for now, it is going to be mostly. Um, let me just go into a web advisor. I was quite unaware of that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, <it's... laughs> wow. Uh, it's crashing. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, no, I just I just uh, caught up in me. Uh, okay, like in, like in, please. Any minute, give me give me a sec. Flash okay, flash. I can I can talk Here about it. it. So it. It is. Um, Intro to GIS happens on uh, on a Monday and Wednesday, eleven to twelve thirty p.m. It's it's a uh, yeah it's a uh, G four eighty and five eighty it's double coded. Uh, it happens on a Monday Wednesday eleven a.m. to twelve thirty p.m. And what room is it meeting in? Is it right the now it's the on, online right now. There's no uh, designated uh, room, but most likely it will be at two o seven. G G two I mean. Um, HSS 207. So last um, time, yeah, last time I had it uh, fully online. So no problem with uh, if we're still going to do it online, no problem. And we're using QGIS, which is free and open source. QGIS is great. It really is. Yeah. It's really powerful uh, in terms of open source software. And I think it does rival. Uh, the Republic of Palau is using QGIS. They went completely open source for their uh, GIS needs for their government. Um, but uh, sorry, we digress. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, questions, concerns, comments, feedback on Oh, you're, you're welcome, Ulysses. You had a busy day. You had drone corps this morning. <laughs> oh, Charles Hambly, student testimonial. He really recommends taking the class. Great, Charles. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for staying and, uh, and uh, coming to our webinar. Please uh, let your friends know uh, that we are offering these courses. Dr. Aban will be offering Introduction to Remote Sensing in the spring. And we will also have a concurrent uh, graduate course for that as well, just FYI. Yep. Yes, and thank you to Keanu and John for uh, for coordinating the logistics of this and also uh, being backup moderators to take care of any private questions or logistics. We really are blessed with a great team. So, and thank, thank you so you much for the team. Thank you, especially you, Dr. King, and your your <laughs> um, your team, Keanu, uh, John, <laughs> well, Rihanna, and uh, Leslie. Leslie, Dr. Leslie, yeah. and, and Sayama, Janelle, thank you. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Okay, guys, I'm going to stop.